Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I'm going to resume the story now of Joseph. We begin in chapter 39 and 40 today. I think there's some very interesting things here about the character of Joseph. It's obviously there's a play between the character of Joseph and the character of Potiphar's wife here in 39 and 40 and the character of Judah and the character of Tamar back in 38. Notice it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar. Now the name Potiphar appeared back in 37 verse 36. We think it means the son, he whom the son God gives. It's a very Egyptian name, although we don't find it really later uh, in Egyptian history. It's obviously an Egyptian name. An Egyptian officer. Many have said, well, that's redundant. Why would it say that? Well, if it's true that this is the Hyksos period, the Semitic kings called the shepherd kings in Egypt, that that is the background of Joseph, uh, then the fact the man was an Egyptian author, uh, officer is significant. Now, it says an officer of Pharaoh. Now, first of all, the word officer is the word eunuch. Originally, this meant, of course, someone who was physically castrated. But we found some, uh, some connection, especially with Aramaic words, uh, that seems to mean that this man is a courtier, an official at court, uh, not necessarily a physical eunuch. Now, the word Pharaoh, of course, is the title for every one of the Egyptian rulers. Uh, we learn that the basic etymology is from the great house. And, of course, he was believed to be the the son of the sun god, Ra. And so the great house refers to the palace. Uh, The captain of the bodyguard. Now, of course, this is the chief executioner. executioner. Uh, But most of us believe it's the captain of the bodyguard and not simply a butcher or some kind of a super slayer at court. Uh, Let's see. Now, notice it says, "...and brought him from the Ishmaelites." Well, there's been a big fight now about the, is there are two different accounts here, uh, one of supposedly the J source and one the E source. I personally reject the documentary hypothesis of Wellhausen and Graft, the JEDP theory of source criticism of the Pentateuch. Uh, the Ishmaelites back in 3736 is obvious when you compare, uh, 3728, Genesis 3728, that Ishmaelites and Midianites means the same. And even if there is a textual uh, variation there, uh, to the uh, instead of Midian, it may be Medianites, we learn from earlier in Genesis that they're relatives too. Now also in Judges 8, 22 and 24, the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are identified as the same group. So I personally don't see any problem here at all. And the Lord was with Joseph. Well, that's going to be the theme of this entire chapter. Matter of fact, it's quite unique. In all this extended history of Joseph, this chapter, these two, are the only ones, particularly 39, where the covenant name for God, Yahweh, appears. Now, it appears in connection with how God is uniquely blessing Joseph. And that is a repetitive theme throughout this chapter. It's going to be obvious to everybody who sees Joseph that God is uniquely with him. And matter of fact, this blessing is transferred to those for whom Joseph works. And uh, that's very interesting, I think. Became a successful man. The implication of the word here is that not only that God gave it to him, but that he was a, that he uh, strove toward that, that his characteristics also lended toward that. Now, and he was in the house of his master. Now, this implies one of two things. Either he was in the house versus the servant quarters, or it's a way of saying he ministered in the house instead of in the field. It's one of those two. Uh, the Egyptian. <clears throat> Now, his master thought the Lord was with him. This does not imply that Potiphar knew Yahweh. It simply means it was obvious that this young man had some uh, obvious divine blessings. And how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. Now, I want to say to you, it wasn't because he wanted to help his slave. It was for his own personal gain, uh, just the way Laban wanted to use Jacob. And he made him overseer over his household, and all that he owned he put in his charge. We found that in archaeology now it's common uh, for this particular overseer to be over large Egyptian estates. And if it is the Hyksos period, it's not unusual that other than Egyptians had these high offices. Now, notice it says, And it came about that from that time he made him overseer of his house, and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. Potiphar was greatly increasing because of Joseph's presence. Now, 
So he left everything he owned to Joseph's charge, and with him um, round he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. I was interested in reading Rashi on this. Rashi says that this word food, word bread, refers to his wife. And Joseph's going to mention that he had everything but his wife. Some say, no, this refers to the Egyptian dietary laws. I think the guy just liked food and wanted to take care of himself. (laughs) I don't think there's any other reason for it. Notice it says, now Joseph was handsome handsome in form and appearance. This very same Hebrew phrase is used of his mother Rachel in Genesis 29.17. There are some very other attractive people in the Bible this is used for. Although the exact phrase is not used for Saul, he was a very tall, dark, handsome man. The exact kind of phrasing in Hebrew is used for both David David and his son Absalom. So it's a common way of saying uh, Joseph was a handsome boy. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. Now apparently he had been dressed up in, a, in a much more attractive clothes and uh, was serving the master well. How many years had passed or months, we just don't know. And she came and said, lie with me. Now, we know from Egyptian documents that the women were allowed to have social um, interaction with the men of that society. And there's even kind of a reputation from the ancient historians that Egyptian women were pretty promiscuous. And, of course, this account seems to back that up. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, uh, with me around, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. He has put all that he owns at my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Well, it's very interesting to me to know that he's trying to very logically tell her she has a very high place with this man, uh, and so does Joseph, and let's, let's don't violate that. And then he goes on to say, let's don't sin against Elohim, God. When talking to her, she obviously not a religious person. He doesn't mention Yahweh. He mentions the common name for God in the Middle East, Elohim. Now, it's plural, but we don't think it means a polytheism. It's just the general name for God, El, and a characteristic plural title, Elohim. It's used for the angels sometime, but mostly it's translated God with a capital G in the English Bible. Now, the fact about sinning against God is interesting. He recognized that sexual sin was not just against his master, but also against his God. As Judah had no qualms about sexual sin, Joseph seems to remember uh, the ways and teachings of his fathers and, and holds to this kind of purity. Now, I notice he would, it came about as she spoke to Joseph day after day. What a repeated, subtle temptation this was. She just kept after him day after day. And he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. She apparently said, I just, just come sit with me. Let's talk. Let's get to know each other better. It's kind of a subtle temptation. Uh, he refused that altogether. Now, it happened on one day. Now, some come here and say it's a special day, a feast day. Some even say it was a, a day to go to the temple. And she said she'd rather stay home. But I thought they can read that in there. He went into the house to do his work. The implication was he had to go in. He was in charge of the house. And none of the men of the household was there inside. She may have sent them away or planned this, but the opportunity was right for her big move. And she caught him by the garment saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Now, I agree that was kind of maybe uh, momentarily dumb of Joseph to leave his garment in there. But the boy's got a good heart. We see some of this... uh, Biblical encouragement to flee from lustful youth. You know the boy had sexual desires, but he had subliminated them to his faith in God. You might well see 2 Timothy 2.22 and 2 Peter 1.4. And I think those are, are good parallel passages. When she saw that he, she had left his garment in her hand uh, and fled outside, she called to the men of her household. Now it's obvious that her... Uh, What's the old adage about there's no fury like a woman spurned? Well, boy, this lady put it all over him. (laughs) I guarantee you, she was upset. And said to them, See, he has bought in a Hebrew to uh, uh, to us to make sport of us. Now, there's several things here. Number one, she seems to be blaming her husband, saying it's your fault you brought this boy in. It's your fault that I that I wanted to make love to him. This same uh, fault finding with her husband for her own lust is found in verse 19 again. Secondly, there seems to be some racial overtones. This Hebrew. Now, of course, the Hebrew. We're not sure exactly what the etymology is. Most people take it back to the sons of Eber back in Genesis 11:16. Now, it's also possible uh, that it comes from the term Hibaru, which simply means uh, some of those people who were, had migrated into this area 
and were settled in different localities. We learn of them from the Tel El Armana letters, and it's a wider group than just the, uh, the Jews. It's more like a good term for Semites. Many believe the Hyksos ruler were of this uh, Hebrew uh, group. Now, notice it mentions then, let's see, oh, make sport of is probably a euphemism for rape here. And it came about that when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed and left his garment beside me and fled. I went outside. Uh, she left his garment beside her until the master came home. And she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us, again implying her it was a husband's fault, came in to me to make sport of me. And it happened that I raised my voice and screamed and left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when it came about that his master heard these words of his wife, which she had spoke to him saying, This is what your slave did to me. Again, he's blaming his wife, blaming the husband, right? Uh, his anger burned. Now, I don't think we can take that in a very radical sense because the truth is, though the man was mad, he obviously is not infuriated. He may have uh, felt like there was some reason to doubt his wife in, in all different respects. Uh, we're just not sure. Uh, basically, what he's, he's going to do is not the normal punishment for... Um, finding somebody with your wife, which was death, we learn from some of the ancient documents, he's going to put him in prison. Uh, now, the prison we think he was in charge of, but we're not altogether sure of that. Let me see. This is what your slave did to me. His anger burned, so Joseph's master took him and put him into jail. This is a very unusual term for jail. Don't you know God, Joseph must have thought, oh my... Is God still with me here? What's happening in my life? He must have really wondered. Now we'll see chapter 40, verse 15. He wondered, but he still had great faith. The place where the king prisoners were confined, and it was there in the jail. This is a very unusual, rare term for a jail. It comes from the Hebrew word to encircle. Therefore, some think it was a round building. Uh, from Egyptian documents, we learned that often this was connected to the grounds or the house of the the chief of the bodyguard. So maybe Potiphar just moved him from the house into some very close to his own house, the prison for these very special governmental prisoners. That seems to be the fact he didn't punish him more. And of what's going to happen in chapter 40 says his wife may have pulled this stunt before, uh, although that's not specific in the text. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight um, of the chief jailer. That didn't mean he didn't have a hard time in prison, but God was with him. Uh, and the chief jailer uh, committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. Now, this seems to be talking about Potiphar again because of chapter 40, verse 3. Now, the title's the same in chapter 40, verse 3, and I think Potiphar knew he, the God's blessing on Joseph and decided if I can't use him at the house because it'll look bad not to believe my wife, I'm going to use him in my work and I'll still get uh, benefit out of his uh, unique blessing relationship with God. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper, even in jail. Now, chapter 40. Then it came about that these things, the cupbearer and the baker of the king. Now, this word cupbearer, we know, is like a butler. This is what Nehemiah was in Nehemiah 1.11. We also learned from a Second Kings 18.17, an Aramaic form of this word, Rosh Shavan, Shah, <laughs> it's R-A-B-S-H-A-K-E-H, -H, which means chief cupbearer. It was a common title. It was the guy who checked the food to make sure it was good and clean and no poison. Okay. Now, the baker was another important official. Uh, we learned from Egyptian documents there were 38 kinds of cakes and 57 kinds of bread baked in Egypt in, these, in this period of time. So this was a very fancy office. Not only did they make the colors different, the shapes different, but the different ingredients, different kinds of grain. So it was an important baking job, apparently all the king's food. Now, Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cup bearer and the chief baker. I got so tickled at Rashi. <laughs> Rashi said that they found a fly in the king's wine. It's why the cup bearer got in trouble. And says they found a pebble in the king's bread. And that's what got the chief baker in trouble. Well, I don't know what it was, but he was upset enough to put these two guys in this special prison. Now, Pharaoh was furious with his two chief officials, verse 3. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard. And again, that's just like 39.1, the, the, the title for Potiphar. It seems to be two different people, but um, it looks like it's the very same thing because of the way Joseph is treated. Now, notice uh, where Joseph was in prison. Now, the last word here in verse 3 is the word bound. 
I'm sure if we know from Egyptian documents, they bound the legs of prisoner. I think probably Joseph was in leg stocks for some period of time. Uh, but because of his great abilities, he was let loose to ministry to the men. Matter of fact, he's going to be put in charge of these two men. These were high officials. Uh, you hate to make these high officials mad because the king might restore them. And then where are you? So he put Joseph in charge of these two men to take care of them. And that's what verse 4 uh, is all about. Then the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, had both had a dream the same night. Now remember that Joseph, very early in his life, had a dream about his own life. Uh, he had interpreted dreams now since a youth. Many of us think that all these problems happened to Joseph because of the tinge of arrogance we see uh, in, the, in these earlier parts of his life where there was some real uh, braggadociousness in the boy. God kind of worked all that out in these years of being sold by his own brothers and tricked by Potiphar's wife and uh, um, really kind of let down by these men he's going to help. So God developed him in some rather severe ways. Now, notice then, they had a dream, and they couldn't get to their normal interpreters, which would be the priest of Egypt. There's a lot of documents we have from Egypt uh, that deal with interpreting dreams, okay? Then Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, and they were dejected. Now, the word here in Hebrew means very angry, but it's used here in context for dejected. They were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the confinement in the master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? And they said to him, We had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to Elohim? Again, he uses the general name for God, one they would recognize. Joseph throughout his life recognized that all of his blessings and all of his abilities came from one source, and that's the God of heaven, the covenant God of his fathers. And he mentions that over and over again. Tell it to me. Please. Now, he obviously had a gift. He knew he did. Some have chastised him for not praying at this point, but I think that's rather much. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was wine in front of me. Now, there have been many historians based on Herodotus that say that wine was not used in Egypt, or at least they didn't use fermented wine. Now, that is not quite accurate. Uh, I think we've misquoted Herodotus at that point and without going into to the archaeological evidence from other historians. It seems that fermented wine was pretty much reserved in these earlier uh, dynasties in Egypt to the priestly class and the royal class. Uh, but the king would have always had access. And this dream, there seems to be a cluster of wine. It seems to ripen very quickly and the implication is ferment very quickly. Now, so there was, there was three branches and there was clusters of wines and, and uh, he grabbed these clusters and squeezed them out into the king's special cup uh, and the king uh, drank it. And so Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. Now, there's going to be a real pun on this word lift up. Here in verse 13, it's very positive. To lift the face was to recognize who it is and restore to favor. There's going to be a pun here. The other guy's going to get his face lifted too. But it's going to be in the sense of his head cut off. So it's two different uses of the word to lift the head. And restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand, according to your former custom, when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a hesed, a kindness, by remembering me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have me put into the dungeon." Uh, many critical scholars say, ah, this is the obvious thing. We have a combination of, of these two different sources because here it says that he was uh, sold into slavery and, and doesn't mention his brothers. Well, obviously he wouldn't mention his brothers in this account. He's not going to mention all the family dirty clothes. Uh, he, he says he was just sold into slavery. Now, the idea about remember me to Pharaoh is going to become very important in the later scheme of the history of Joseph, Okay. Now, this is about the Hebrew. They say, Joseph, this is an anachronism because the word Hebrew, he wouldn't know what the land of the Hebrews is. Well, uh, Abraham takes on the name of Hebrew. Uh, earlier, Jacob describes himself as a Hebrew to foreigners. It's possible they would not know the exact geographical location of Abraham's journeys, Jacob's journeys. But he may be just another name for the land of Palestine. And we just don't have enough historical and uh, evidence at this point to make a judgment. I personally don't think it's an anachronism. It's either related to the word uh, Eber, uh, Genesis 11, or this Heberu, which was a larger group of, of Semites. Now, 
When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I saw in my dream, and behold, there were baskets of white bread on my head. Now, it's interesting that Rashi, the word white, has been somewhat uh, argued over. Some say it just refers to white bread. Rashi says it refers to peeled willow branches of a wicker kind of basket that had a lot of holes in it. And it was saying the birds could pick through the holes as well as from the top. Now, it's interesting that this bread was carried on the head. Now, in Canaan, women carried water and, and, and weight on their head, but it's unique in Egypt that only men carried weight on their head. The women carried the weight on their shoulders in Egypt. So here is an, an interesting historical um, detail. Now, so he has this basket of all sorts of bread, and I mentioned earlier to you that... Um, it's very interesting. There was 38 kinds of cakes and 57 kinds of bread that we know from Egypt. Boy, they already had a their bakery was loaded, wasn't it? Uh, baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating uh, them out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, "This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days more, Pharaoh will lift your head uh, from you, and you will hang on a tree, and the birds will eat your the, your flesh off of you." Oh, yuck. <laughs> what a different interpretation. That guy was real th thrilled. I'm amazed the commentators say, did Joseph do this tactfully? Well, I bet the, the guy did. He, I don't think he's anything mad at this man. Now, what's this deal about uh, you're gonna, he's going to cut off your head then hang you on a tree? Friends, it's tough to be hanged if your head's cut off. Now, I think this word hang should be impaled. Even in the older parts of the Old Testament, particularly Deuteronomy 21-23, it said, Curses everybody who's hanged on a tree. And if you know that, the Hebrews didn't use hanging as a way of death. But once someone was killed, in a way of publicly shaming them, they would not bury them, but impale them publicly or hang them from the city gate as a way to expose their naked body and... Uh, for those people, the Jews, it was a horrendous problem. Now, you know for the Egyptians, who are known for their embalming, that that would be a terrible death for the birds to eat you. Now, of course, if you're over in the parts of India and, I, and Iran, that's the normal way of what they do to dead bodies. They put them on the top of the towers of silence and the birds eat them. But not the Egyptians and not the Hebrews. This man would have been appalled. By the way, that Deuteronomy 21:23 passage is one that's used for the crucifixion of Christ. In the New Testament sense, that's why the high priest wanted Christ crucified. So this curse of God from Deuteronomy 21, 23 would apply to him and he'd be cursed by God. I think that's what bothered Paul. He said, how can Jesus be the Messiah and be cursed by God? Well, friends, that's what Galatians 3.13 tells us, that he bore our curse for us. And I think this place right here about hanging on a tree and be eaten by the birds uh, is related to that impalement and public shame. Now, thus it came about on the third day that Pharaoh had a birthday. We learn from Egyptian documents that the birthday of Pharaoh was a feast, not only in the palace and a big party, but usually the whole country. All work was suspended in the whole country party. And quite often, like uh, later on in the New Testament, the uh, Roman uh, governor of Palestine gave some clemency on that uh, special day uh, to sh make people happy. Uh, Pharaoh was known for doing amnesty on that day. So it says here now that he made a party and all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker. Now, this is either, again, a pun on this lifted up the head because one of them is going to be restored and one of them is going to be publicly killed. It's either that or it's very cruel irony on the part of Pharaoh. Uh, but I think probably it's just an act of amnesty and an act of justice. And he restored the cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But uh, he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had in, uh, interpreted to them Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph and forgot him. Don't you have the discouragement for Joseph? He seemed to be forsaken again, and yet the presence of the blessing of God was with him. It wasn't yet time, but it would come up soon. So I think here we have an interesting historical account. We're going to continue, of course, the uh, story of Joseph later. There's some tremendous, uh, I think, character traits on Joseph that are just so applicable to our day here. The man recognized that his blessing was from the Lord. And he gave God the credit for all that. He also was not tempted by the normal, useful lust of even members of his own family like Judah. 
I think that's characteristic. That's interesting here. I also want to say that the blessing of God on Joseph's life did not mean that Joseph didn't have real problems. I think he was probably somewhat physically abused in that prison originally. I think he must have had his feelings hurt the way he was uh, uh, charged falsely by this uh, lustful woman. Friends, just because you know God doesn't mean you're not going to have problems in life. Here is a very godly man suffering for the sake of righteousness. But God's involved for a purpose. It's much like the book of Job, like Psalm 73, like Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4. Um, I believe it like Jeremiah. I believe this reference is 7, 13 or 17, 1 through 3. You, you can check that. People struggle with this. But I want to tell you what. There's too much false preaching today that if you love God, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Look at Joseph. For long years, not just a few months, but for years, maybe even over a decade, he suffered for righteousness' sake. He was by the hand of his own brothers, uh, by the hand of a master who should have known better, uh, by this uh, cupbearer who should have helped him, on and on. But God was with him. Friends, I don't know all you're going through, but I know the God who's going through it with you. And I want to tell you, nothing just happens to God's people. God's with you. Trust Him. He will work it out. If not in this life, in the next. I can't answer all the questions about individual destinies. But I, want to, I know this, God's not only in control of history, but he is actively involved in the lives of individuals. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you, and I hope to see you again, same time, same place. May the Lord bless you and be with you.